Hello friends and welcome back. Uh, this is part two of my uh, series of my digital eight lesser known things. Things you might not have known in um, in digital music that are uh, quite influential. And, and just because in the marketing and so on, they're lesser mentioned and we continue, we're picking up our stories. Here at point five, we in, in part one, we actually watched that, but it, um, we've talked about other things. Um, the first four points, now I'm going to go to the second four points. And that's about the listening floor, uh, the noise floor in your listening environment and how relevant it is to the number of bits. So let's have a look at an, uh, a living room. Somebody took these measurements, probably in the US, because as I can see here, he has some hum here at 60 hertz and 120 hertz. So I'm presuming this person is United States or in some part of Japan. But given that we don't have Japanese characters here, I would just venture to guess um, maybe Canada or the US. So let's have a look. This person has a living room. As you can see, the noise floor here, it is reasonably quiet in, this, um, in, in the living room. So I wouldn't say there's a lot of traffic or in, in the middle of the city in an apartment block. Um, so 35 decibels here in the, our uh, hearing frequency, in, in our sensitive regions where we are the most sensitive with our hearing. And as here you see it at the bottom end, it creeps up to even 55 decibels. So that's pretty loud in the, in the low frequencies. And you can here also see some one, two, three, four kilohertz, some overtones from a one kilohertz thing. I don't know where it's coming from. It's uh, interesting. Well, that aside, what we want to see is when we normally play music in a living room and say, normally I would say I play at 75. My situation might actually be quite similar. Um, I would play maybe at 75 decibels. And so my dynamic range would be this from 35 to 75 which is only 40 decibels really and but that's not actually true because our hearing is way better than that we we, we are able to even in a loud room to hear a, a reasonably quiet conversation we can tune into that we, we we can see into the noise floor so we can actually hear around this region here it's less but here we can see about 10 decibels into the into the living room into the noise floor so that would give me 25 to 75, which is 50 decibels of effective range. Now, you might say, let's just let's just blow this out of proportion. Say I want to play at 100 decibels um, loud, loudness in my room. So I really want to crank it up or I got a, cl a classic concert that is periodically loud and then goes back to the softer. So I need the whole range and my hearing is not uh, damaged because if you know everybody that has played with fireworks or a gun, would know that if you shoot it or something and there's a loud bang, your noise, own noise floor from your ear goes up and you can't hear these quieter things for a little while until your hearing recovers. So our hearing can't really do 105 dBs and, 20, uh, and, and 25 dBs at the same time. You don't hear those things at the same time. So keep bear that in mind when we look at this. But so then we have 100 to 25, which just gives us 75, right? So we actually got practically, we got 100 minus 25 is 70 the dBs of a dynamic range that we actually need in our living room. So a good turntable will do 80 decibels signal to noise. A 14 bit deck will also do almost 85, sort of about the same level. So that would actually suffice because if something happens at, and, and I saw some uh, measurements in Stereophile, one of the, I mean, Stereophile does very consistent testing, which is really nice, but it, when they measure a sine wave at minus 90 dB, that is, you know, it, it, for 16-bit decks, that looks naturally very bad. Like all, the, all those 16-bit decks in their test will come out bad, but you have to realize that what they don't tell you is how relevant it is, because if you play at 80 decibels, um, volume that minus 90 dB is like minus 10 dB. It's it's completely irrelevant, and that is usually the thing that John Atkinson doesn't ma ma mention. He just measures it, yes, and it measures worse. But in your living situation, it's complete rubbish. It's just irrelevant, and so you always have to think with measurements. Yes, they that is what was measured. It's true, and on that measure. It can look very well, but then you need to ask yourself, how relevant is it to my listening? Because maybe other things like implementation matter way more. Uh, like you can have a, uh, 
something that meshes crappy sounds good and something that meshes poorly and, and does sound good so or you, you have that sounds uh, or meshes poorly and it sounds poorly but it's probably something else than what you're measuring now let's have a look really once now that we established that we we have this relevancy in the number of bits that we actually need is we can still look at hey what are modern decks doing better um, than older decks and one of the things I will say to you here is that all modern decks, especially those 24-bit and 32-bit decks that are so qualified, are all limited by their noise floor. So there is no chance for them to actually produce a 24-bit signal. They get close, but they're not. And we can see that here. So if I look at the AK4399 EX EQ, it's a whole mouthful, um, it's dynamic range. And dynamic range is measured as the thing um, when the, sig the loudest signal versus the, the uh, quietest signal, but it can only be measured as long as the distortion stays um, under 1%. So it, it is quite a good measurement um, tool, better than signal to noise, because that can be cheated. Because um, um, I'll tell you why uh, signal to noise can be cheated. I'm not sure if I actually took the right. Um, qualifier here but so it's is spec as 135 decibels and that translates into 20 to 22 bits so we don't look at the quality of the signal just what it can do the softest that so if you have the noise floor at the bottom as you saw in the living room the the deck itself also has a noise floor because even resistors like passive components make a noise when you send power through them so what they then do is is measure the, 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 the smallest thing that is registered to the loudest thing and then you have a band you get this dynamic the, the dynamic range and so that is translates to 22 to 23 the bit so this is one of the best ones probably and it has amazing specs but it's absolutely still not 24 bit and let alone the 32 bits that it's qualified for here another one the latest uh, just recently received last year released ESS Sabre 9039 Pro, signal to noise. Um, so signal to noise can be a bit cheated because if there's a mute function on the deck and it gets quieter because nothing is on and then you produce the signal, you have a very high signal to noise ratio. But when you take that off the deck and you see the spec for um, just one channel, not when you combine the eight channels of the deck together, it's 132 decibels, which equates to 22 bits. Now, if you compare it with an older deck, let's do that. AD 62 had 120 bit, 120 decibel signal to noise ratio. It was a 20 bits deck. This is roughly 20 bits. It was also a 20 bits deck, so it had 20 bits, bits information. So what you see there, those all the designs, they often had the, the number of bits matched to the noise floor that they could uh, could gain. They didn't do more bits just to look good. That only started with the PCM 1704, I think, where they, they, it took 24-bit data, but it was really still a 20-bit deck. But as you can see, we're still limited by the noise floor anyway, so um, this hasn't progressed much. And um, if you took the AD62 just on the basis of um, signal-to-noise ratio and then see how many bits it outcome, if you really measured it, it came to this standard, which is the effective number of bits. So it actually came to 19.6 bits. So over 35 years or so, we actually just gained two, three bits, probably from here. That's all, it's really in dynamic range. We don't talk quality of the sound here, just in softest to loudest and how much the specs improved. Now it looks higher, it is higher, but really, and these bits, if we looked at our, um, you know, our story with the noise floor, and so we, are, we don't, that is well below our noise floor. We can't hear that stuff. What is going? The, the, the quiet, the stuff. Which is not to say that our hearing, what we, what we, our hearing is not up to this type of resolution. It can hear all kinds of differences, but it's not related to the bits. The bits don't tell you how linear and how well sounding it is. It, and, and, and even less your taste. So we can then look at the next thing is, as I said, that is just the loudest versus the softest. Then the next thing we can say is when you have that signal going on, there's always distortion components that fall off out of that. So intermodulation, harmonic distortion, and so on. So we're now we're gonna look at harmonic distortion and noise that happens while you're playing the big signal. Then at some point you, you get all the rubbish. So 
if we stay above the Roberts, we have sort of have the, 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 the space in where we have the clean, clean signal. Now, let's look at the older chips where we started out with. So we had, this was the second DAC chip ever from Philips, um, TDA1541. It was spec as, and, and measured also, by the way, at um, THD plus noise was 100 decibels, which equate to 16, 17 bits. So you had a 16 bit chip, but it, its distortion was lower, uh, even better than, a, than you would expect with a 16 bit. And that was because this, this first deck had used bipolar switching techniques that were so good and, and some people have even improved on this, by the way, but um, uh, it had a very low glitch. So when it was switching the bits, there was very little energy being released um, because they chose the right technology. And that actually delivered this quite extraordinary uh, thing that um, its THD was actually above what you would expect from a 16 bit chip. Here he had the AD 1862, that was a 20 bit chip. But if you look at the TAC, that was actually the distortion was on minus 96 to be. So it was a 20 bit chip, but it performed slightly worse in that read to the 1541. Um, this is also being used in a modern deck. The, uh, have a look at this review. I'll link it in the description. The Mojo Mystique is reviewed by Stereophile, measures really badly, comes out really well um, if you look at the description. But have a look for that yourself. Um, still being used. Uh, Audio Note also uses this chip a lot. So despite these specs, apparently um, people are happily handing over $40,000 for a high quality deck or in this case with the Mojo Mystique, that's a $10,000 deck and it's very competitive. Um, it has its own characteristics with some other decks, but have a look at that. Um, there's an interesting comparison with the DCS uh, Batok. Um, so I'll have that linked as well, which is a five bit uh, Delta Sigma type deck. Um, and, and, and that reviewer has access to both when he reviews this. It's a very interesting comparison. And then let's look at our modern decks. So we got the uh, ESS. If you look at that in not, in not mono uh, for a single channel, it is defined as the distortion comes in at minus 140, uh, 14 decibels. So that equates to 19 bits clean output. And the AK is at minus 124. So that will suggest that it actually has 20 bits of clean input. So as you can see again, we gained about five bits of, of, of accuracy, whether it's relevant, I'll leave that in the middle. If you read this review, you go like, oh, it seems that every approach has its own benefits and, and down uh, downsides. It's not clear cut. Um, so where some of people that commented on my channel just say that this is just absolutely primitive and shocking and you should, if you like to listen to garbage music, yeah, don't go for it. But this is so far superior. But as you can see, it's not. And if you look at reviews like that of, of when the implementation is actually done correctly, you don't take a bad player and compare it to the a good player now. You compare, compare it, use the same technologies, but but you implement them well today, you you still end up with with specific advantages and disadvantages. Now, for those of you that um, that that want to get something as well, what I've seen is speaking about implementation. It is there's a lot of DIYers and also companies like the Dutch company EC Designs, um, Lampasator, which is I think he's I think he's from Poland. Um, has done a lot of research in how to get the best out of those older decks and, and they have really studied generally how you get the most out of a deck also with more, more modern decks and what, what you'll find is that power supply, power, uh, hard wiring, um, uh, um, component quality all comes into it so you can always improve an existing design and if you just want to get a feel for it, Lampasator has an excellent blog where he, he, he has modified about 100 CDs, older CD players, and he has a quite an interesting view on after he's done that, what he could do, how much he could raise the level and basically what you can read from that, that at the time that he did them, which was about 2008, 2009, he could beat any commercial offering or get really close to something like an Audio Note 5, 4 deck, which is, you know, a very expensive deck. And I still and I still see this going on. Some of the top designers in audio still have preferences with those kind of things. And, and they sp spend a lot of, and, and I've seen it with on some online friends as well. They have very elaborate um, 
things that lift those decks to uh, to the best available decks. So um, it's all about implementation, and and his blog is quite sort of a good gateway, uh, I would say, you, you f to to see what you can do, how you can improve something, which things um, influences the, the choices of components and so on. So. I'll leave you with that. I hope this series, this uh, short two-part series, has actually um, given you some information that you uh, um, haven't heard about or about some maybe aware of, and um, that will also be the primer to some of the projects I will be doing in the future, which include creating a deck, a new de deck design, um, experimenting with it, and experimenting with upgrading CD players, because I found already that these old CD players can sound better than modern decks, so. Quite surprising. It's a lesser known thing. You wouldn't expect so, especially if you don't believe the marketing. And uh, I think a lot of people wouldn't like you to know. I don't think any hi-fi magazine is interested that you know those things, but um, there you are. Thank you for tuning in. Um, thank you uh, for, um, for having you on board on my channel. And um, I hope to catch you next time. And until then, have a brilliant day, have a brilliant week. And see you soon, hopefully. Bye-bye.